And life in the law, an update on the Hawaii Supreme Court. Wow. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and the handsome young man is uh, Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald of the, of the Hawaii Supreme Court. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay, and thanks to Think Tech for having me today. Aloha. Absolutely. absolutely. We have so many things to talk about. I, I'm sure we won't get through them all. Uh, we live in difficult times. We're going to talk about some of that you know, today. Um, and I just want to point out that although people may or may not remember, a couple of deca decades ago, you were uh, with the Department of Justice. Uh, I'm not going to ask you your feelings about the current um, you know, investigation, what's going on in Mar-a-Lago and search warrants and affidavits and special masters. I'm not going to ask you about that. I just want to remind people that you had a sterling career here in Hawaii, uh, in the District of Hawaii, as, as an assistant U.S. attorney. And, and now it's mm, decades later. And But that was formative for you, wasn't it? You know, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Hawaii has just wonderful lawyers. It's a very important institution in our community. Uh, we've had great U.S. attorneys leading the office over the years. Um, and right now we have a really good one in Claire Connors. Uh, and so, you know, we're, I think it's a very important part of our community. And we're very lucky to have uh, dedicated professionals uh, with a great deal of experience uh, and expertise uh, in that uh, very important position. Yeah, there's so many national, you know, in, in the past, I, I never thought that national news, national legal news reached out and touched Hawaii in the same way as it does now. But it certainly does. Um, you know, and people say, everyone says, or at least everyone I know says, our, our national democracy is, um, you know, is in, in trouble. It's, a, it's under threat. And also, you know, our environment is a, is a big issue, whether the School of Journalism at UH says it's the most important story of our lifetimes, climate change. Um, and I know that um, you care about both of those things. I, I wanted to just ask you your you know, general reaction to how our national democracy is working uh, and, and how our environmental uh, you know, initiatives are working, especially in view of the, uh, the provisions of the, of the Inflation Reduction Act just a few days ago. Well, you know, with regard to democracy, I think the key, sort of the foundation of the judiciary here and across the country is public understanding, trust, and confidence in what we do. So that has always been sort of a cornerstone of our efforts here is to find ways to reach out to and engage with the public so they, to demystify what we do, to let people understand that what we do has integrity, that, you know, everyone gets a fair shake, they have their voice heard, you may not agree with the decision, but it's a process that's fair and has integrity. And so, you know, our, we've really doubled down on our efforts to try to uh, engage, to try to share information about how our courts work and how our democracy works. We've done that in a couple of different ways. One is through something called the PACE Commission, which was established by our court early last year uh, and is chaired by uh, Chief Judge Lisa Ganoza um, from the Intermediate Court of Appeals. And it's really, uh, developed an ambitious agenda to engage with schools, engage with communities, uh, to try to give people opportunities to learn about uh, the nuts and bolts of democracy, not just the courts. And so that's a very, very important initiative. And for us at the Supreme Court, uh, we've taken our court out into the community uh, to hold oral argument at high schools across the state. That's something we've done for about 10 years now. We did it back in Farrington in uh, 2010, uh, 2012. And we go out and hold real or oral arguments in real cases. So uh, the lawyers come before us in an actual case. Um, and what we do is when we go to a particular community, we ask the lawyers from that community to work with the students to teach them about the case that's going to be heard that day. So they know what the issues are. They know what the role of the lawyers are and the justices. And they sometimes have opportunities to actually do practice arguments themselves before they hear the court. Uh, in action. And that's something we've done now uh, at a number of different schools across the state. I think we've had 5,500 students who've uh, participated in these different uh, arguments. Sometimes we'll have 500 students. We had to pause it during the pandemic, but we're uh, planning on going back to La Haina Luna uh, this fall in, in, in December. We're really excited to coming back to an in-person format. Uh, and excited to be able to go visit Maui again. This will be our third time on Maui since we started the program. So civic education, I think, all the more important uh, than ever uh, in these times. You know, issues around the environment, uh, you know, we have been a leader 
uh, in developing sort of institutional capability for, for dealing with complex environmental issues. And the legislature back around 2014 or 2015 created a statewide environmental court here in Hawaii, uh, which is a relatively unique institution in our, in our country. Uh, Vermont has a statewide environmental court. We have one. There are other institutions sort of like it in different parts of the country, but really our two are the only uh, statewide, statewide environmental courts that exist. And that has been, I think, uh, an experiment that has been very successful. The, the sort of the linchpin of that is the idea that we want judges to have specialized training and expertise when they have these complex cases coming before them so that they're prepared to handle the issues that are coming up. And those issues can range from really you know, complex environmental impact statement and land use issues in our circuit courts to in the district courts, uh, issues around the use of resources. You know what, what it means to take a female lobster out of season in a particular area. What's the impact on the environment of doing that, which is not something that you know, typically would come to the attention of a district court judge, but we try to train and explain uh, and have our judges understand the complexity of these issues so they can do a more effective, fair, uh, and, and, and prompt job of resolving these very important disputes. So those are two areas we've done a lot of work in, Jay. Yeah, I know you have, and I think that's great and it distinguishes us. It distinguishes the judiciary too. Um, and, I, and I, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you for addressing both of those points. Um, now, just a, a couple of weeks ago, you had a special session for uh, C.J. Ron Moon, uh, who I knew pretty well back when, back before he was a judge even. Uh, and he was a, he was a great uh, lawyer, uh, a great uh, litigator, uh, and a great judge. And you went to have a, a special session. Um, what did he mean to the judiciary, C.J.? What did he mean to the state? What did he mean to, you know, the, the legal culture in Hawaii? Well, I think he really, you know, really sort of shaped us into the modern institution we are today in many ways. So look at the administrative side first, you know, institutions like our drug court, um, our girls court, our mental health treatment court. These were, uh, you know, I think very uh, effective initiatives that sort of target resources and again, target, bring a team approach to handling some of the most difficult cases that we face. Folks who are uh, repeatedly violating the law because they're addicted to substances. How do we break that cycle? And that the idea of having these treatment courts was something that started under CJ Moon. He was a strong supporter of. So that was just one example of where he used his sort of leadership, his ability to work with the legislature uh, to create coalitions in support of the work we were doing to, to really make our system work better for the people it's supposed to serve and, uh, and serve the public more effectively. Uh, he was, uh, you know, as at the court itself, many landmark decisions during his tenure uh, from Bear versus Lewin that recognized a, a constitutional right to same sex marriage to uh, the Kalima case that recognized. Uh, the interests or, or rights of folks who are beneficiaries of the Hawaiian Homes Trust uh, to, to address breaches of the trust and all kinds of you know, major environmental cases involving you know, the super ferry and other really profound issues uh, that the court handled during his tenure. So in terms of the legal landscape, he had a huge impact. In terms of uh, the, the work that we do to help people, he had a huge impact. And I think, again, I think the culture of somebody who was extremely professional, had very high standards, but was also a very warm and gracious person, uh, made people feel uh, that they belonged. You know, he came from very humble roots in Wahiwa. Um, you know, I think the, his family had a store out there uh, and he never forgot those roots. And I think that's one of the things that really distinguishes him. He uh, truly uh, cared about and wanted us to serve the needs of people who came into our courts who may not speak English as a first language or who may you know, never have dealt with the court before and may have been apprehensive, un unsure of what was gonna happen, that we would uh, work with those people to make them feel welcome, respected, and to give them a fair shake when they came into our courts. So I think those are all parts of his legacy. I mean, really in terms of his personal legacy, to me and many other judges, he was a mentor and a friend uh, and I, I'm, you know, we'll miss him terribly as an institution. I miss him terribly uh, personally as well. It was really a hard, hard summer for me to lose this person. I really uh, just, you know, idolized, frankly. And his sense of humor too. 
he was hysterical. And, you know, that's a really important part of, um, you know, he'd always start an event with a joke and, uh, you know, always appropriate, always in the right time, you know, but you knew when you were needed to be serious and when you could lighten things up a bit. But I think, again, it was just part of his, you know, effort to make people feel welcome and, and, and sort of relax and be able to say what they had to say in a setting or feel comfortable in a setting and, and sort of demystify, you know, the, the black robe that, um, and, and, and he spoke out about not wanting judges to think too highly of themselves as people, although always having respect for the institution. And so he kind of uh, modeled that uh, through his own, how he interacted with folks. Yeah, you know, it's a hard road to hoe. You become a judge and, and uh, you know, a lot of people are, mm, you know, um, what do you want to say that it changes them. It changes them vis-a-vis -vis their old friends, their, their, their partners, their peers, their colleagues, their associates. And, and uh, it's, it, the, you know, the natural drift is to drift away from your former life. But he didn't do that. He was always friendly. He was always warm. He managed to, uh, you know, find the connection. Uh, and not drift away as as you, I mean, um, you know, you're the same kind of guy, and you you maintain your connections with people. You're always friendly to everybody, and you come on Think Tech Hawaii, which is a really big point. <laughs> I'm glad that I have the opportunity to come, Jane. You know, I, again, I think Think Tech is a really important part of our community as well. I mean, the the work that you do and the uh, voices that you allow to be heard are really it's a really important role you play. So thank you. Thank you. You know, this, so this raises the question of, um, you know, your administration. And I want to ask you a tough question, CJ. How is your administration, which is going to end by age in some three years or so from now? I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. You know, I hope they change the law between now and then, frankly. Uh, but, um, you know, how, how does your administration differ or uh, is similar to his? Well, you know, I built on the work, I think, or, you know, the folks that I work with or that I'm privileged to be part of the team with built on uh, the, the start that CJ got us in Access to Justice. So the Access to Justice Commission was created uh, when he was still Chief Justice. It's really the, the body that sort of provides focus to our efforts to help people who are coming into the civil legal system without an attorney. And there are literally thousands of those people every year. You know, there's small claims cases, there are landlord tenant cases, uh, there, there, there are, there are um, collections actions, and there are literally thousands of family court cases where people just can't afford a lawyer. And they're coming in and they really have no alternative, <coughs> excuse me, but to represent themselves. Now, you know, we can try and we have done a great job, I think, of getting more funding for our legal services providers for legal aid. Uh, and other institutions who do provide representation for folks who can't afford it. But for those people who you know, aren't able to be served by legal aid, uh, we've tried really hard through our commission to uh, have volunteer uh, um, access to justice rooms and um, self-help centers where lawyers can come, volunteer their time for maybe you know, half an hour with each person, 15 minutes, just to orient them to the system, answer some basic questions, so when they go into court, they have some idea of what's going to happen and what they need to present. So that's been a partnership that sort of the signature achievement of our Access to Justice Commission. We probably helped, started in Kauai back around, I think, 2011. We've helped more than, I think, 30,000 people statewide at these centers. And so really tried to build on the great start that uh, CJ Moon gave us by creating the commission. Uh, and try to really push Hawaii forward. And, you know, the most, they do a national ranking of different states and how we how they uh, function on access to justice. They look at things like language access, disability access, um, access to services for folks who aren't represented. The most recent one of those, we came in sixth between California and New York. And this isn't adjusted for like the resources we have. This is just based on the quality of the services that we provide. So I, I think we've, uh, you know, because we have people who care, because we have people we're willing to volunteer and just work their hearts out to try to make sure that we actually provide justice for all in a way that's fair and respectful. We've been able to achieve amazing things. So that's, I think, the thing that I really look at and think is, you know, something that I feel is really important that uh, the judiciary has been able to accomplish while I've been here. Yeah, you know, really, uh, it, it does, uh, in many ways, to me, it defines your administration, access to justice. 
is not just one thing. It's hundreds of things you've done over the past uh, few years, and you've you've been on it the whole time. And let me add that, uh, you know, we talk about uh, public confidence. Um, and after all, we know that uh, uh, public confidence is the firmest pillar of good government. And public confidence in the judiciary is so critically important. And uh, I read uh, this morning by one of your press releases that Angela Min, uh, the Judiciary Chief Innovations Officer, which is really kind of an extraordinary thing to have in the first place, to have somebody who is the Chief Innovations Officer. And she's terrific, by the way. She's yeah. perfect for that. Um, so now she has established a small claims online dispute resolution pilot in the Third Circuit, and we'll soon uh, duplicate that in the Fifth Circuit. And it's a way, you know, to learn by COVID, I suppose, to learn by, you know, remote remote connection um, and make justice that way for small claims. This is really a fabulous idea. Why didn't we think of this, you know, before COVID, actually? <laughs> so, well, actually, this one was, this is, you know, this one was actually in the works uh, pre-COVID. So this was something we had looked at, thought about. Uh, and really, it's the idea, again, in this one category of cases, small claims cases, where, frankly, folks are representing themselves. Can we make it easier for them to engage with the courts? Uh, and the idea is really to have a system where they could sort of engage, sort of from, you know, be, be able to file the case, get things started, engage with the other party, uh, get the process rolling uh, completely online. And I think that's you know, really, you know, Jay, I mean, there, there are cases that should be done in person that have to be done in person. Uh, but then there's a whole category of cases that, frankly, you know, if, if you're going to require people to take off from work, drive to the courthouse, find parking and spend, you know, get child care and spend an entire day of vacation just to get in front of the court, you know, to then come back again two months later and maybe again uh, two months after that, they're just not going to participate. And so, we had sort of identified that as an area where we needed to look at and become, uh, you know, more sort of, you know, more responsive to the, to the sort of expectations of the public in an era where I, there is, frankly, online dispute resolution all over the place. You know, if you're unhappy with Amazon, if you're unhappy with a, a transaction on eBay, you know, you, you engage in an online dispute resolution process. So the idea was to uh, begin step, you know, getting our toes into the water. And, and the process, this pilot project has been very successful. It's been in the first and second circuit now for about a year. So we're just now rolling it out in the third circuit. And I'm really excited about it. But the thing, I, one thing I will mention, Jay, you know, we were thinking about this, we had it in the works, but then uh, COVID hit. And as you pointed out, you know, then something remarkable happened, which is we had to pivot from basically being an in-person institution, you know, an institution that people came in, that we see them face-to-face, -face, cases were adjudicated in a brick and mortar courthouse to having to do pr our proceedings remotely. And, uh, you know, really we had great leaders who stepped up. We, we moved to Zoom just like everyone else um, and WebEx. And we have, you know, at the height of the pandemic, we had about 20,000 uh, hearings a month that were being uh, heard by Zoom. And we really, you know, as we go forward, um, we're, we're sort of trying to figure out how to incorporate that into who we are. And really, it's already happened. And so we have rules that just went into effect that sort of identify which hearings are going to be presumptively on Zoom, which are going to be presumptively in person. Um, you know, there are jury trials in criminal cases. They should, they have to be in person, I think. And uh, there's a right to confrontation. Uh, I think you want the jury in the courtroom seeing the, the witnesses in person. But, you know, traffic, traffic infractions, um, you know, frankly, you know, why do we want to make somebody come in, you know, and again, take a day off, drive in, park, and spend a morning to, to contest a citation that might be $125. They're just not going to do it. Um, so, you know, you have to pick the right kind of cases. You have to understand that some people don't have the technology and adjust for that fact. But, you know, the revolution that we were trying to instigate when we sort of started thinking about ODR uh, happened and it's, you know, it's already, it sort of happened all around us for the last two and a half years. And it's really changed how we operate as an institution. And I think, uh, again, I think it makes us more accessible and that's, that's, a, that's a positive development. Yeah, let me offer the thought that this really falls in a similar category as your um, discussion of uh, having, having a Supreme Court argument 
uh, and appearances, um, you know, on the neighbor islands, because, uh, you know, there's, there's always the risk in Hawaii that the neighbor islands drift away. Um, they're, they're not treated as important, as, as important as, as Oahu is. Um, and I, I, it, I think it's also a, a point of your administration, also defines your administration to allow access to justice and, um, you know, move, move the courts out to the neighbor islands. And this, 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 along with uh, uh, you know having having hearings and the like on the neighbor islands and letting those kids see what it's like to be in a courtroom, that's that's remarkable and wonderful. Um, and this also, this uh, online dispute resolution, it's in the same vein. It's the same concept, isn't it? Well, frankly, you know, think think about the Big Island. I mean, there are people there who are you know, certainly an hour, maybe hour 15 away from the courthouses. You know, if you live in Na'alehu and you're trying to drive to Hilo or to uh, our courthouse in Kona, it's a long, long drive. And so, and then on Maui, you have people who are on Molokai and Lanai when our circuit courthouse is in, in Wailuku. So, you know, there really are uh, uh, real challenges for people to get to court uh, in those areas. You know, not that we don't have them here on Oahu, but um, again, I think the idea of using remote technology to make us ourselves more accessible to people who otherwise just might not be able to participate, might choose not to participate, they might just default. I mean, so that's, you know, that's the sort of what a denial of access to justice is when someone just says, you know what, I'm just not going to show up. I think I have a case. I feel like, you know, I'm right or I have something to say to the judge, but I, I just can't afford to take off and go down there, you know, so I think it's made us it's made us more accessible and you know I, I i we have great people on the neighbor islands really strong circuits you know in in, in uh on the big island in maui and in and Kauai, really smart dedicated judges and staff and they do a fantastic job and they really did a great job during the pandemic so uh, i i agree jay i think we need to support their efforts Generally speaking, you know, there are areas where the the the, the uh, neighbor islands lack in resources, and you know, one area that we're focusing on now as this new legislative session comes up are, you know, the options that might exist for treatment uh, or or alternatives, um, you know, for uh, for example, women offenders who are coming into the criminal justice system, and I think it's a really interesting issue. There was a lot of really good work done this past session. Uh, to establish, for example, here in the First Circuit, a women's court pilot project, which is much the same as I described before, the sort of treatment court model where women who are coming into the criminal, criminal justice system, they come in for different reasons. The vast majority uh, have been subject to some kind of trauma early in their life. And that, you know, that then you go down the road and there are substance abuse issues, mental health issues that you need to address if you want that person to be able to move forward in a positive way. That's the idea of this women's treatment court. Judge Mark Browning uh, and his team really put together a great proposal. The legislature funded it. We're very, very grateful uh, to both the judiciary and finance and ways and means chairs for supporting it. We're gonna stand it up with uh, Judge Trish Morikawa as a presiding judge, and we hope to have it underway by early next year. And we think we're gonna get some really good results and I'm hopeful that we can find initiatives for the neighbor islands because what, one of the things we really need, Jay, is tools that judges have where rather than incarcerate somebody who's not a threat to, you know, we're not talking now about people who are dangerous in the sense of, of, of potential for violence. We're talking about folks who may have substance abuse issues. They're, they're violating the law. And they need to be held accountable. But how are we going to do that? And can we do that in a way, for example, if they're women who have kids, can we find a way to put them on a positive path uh, without incarcerating them and then having their children go into the child welfare system or be raised by somebody who might not be a great parent for them? And that then creates an entire another generation of folks who have, are, are coming into our system. And that's what we don't want. So that was a real emphasis of the legislature this year to look for alternatives uh, to give our judges more options and, and to give uh, women who are coming out of the correctional system more options. And I think more of that could happen on the neighbor islands. And that's something we're certainly looking at. I think I'd be right if I said that we are in a um, judicial inflection point these days. It's not only because of COVID, it's just changing times. And it's the innovations you're talking about, these very things. Um, create an inflection point for the judiciary. And of course, the judiciary is, is sort of the backbone of government in the sense that 
that's the part that people have contact with. That's the part they engage with, like it or not. Um, do you see it that way? Well, I think it's critical. You know, we all want public safety. We all want to make sure that our community is safe. Judges live in this community. We want the same thing that, you know, that everyone wants, which is a community where we feel safe and we feel that our families are safe. The question is, how do you get there? And you need to look at the data and understand you know, where the risks are and how you can achieve the best possible outcome. So the idea of doing treatment courts has been shown over time to be an effective way of getting people off the path of using drugs. I mean, if you go to a drug court graduation, you know, you'll hear people talk about, you know, turn to their loved ones who come to the, they're in this program for say two years to three years. It's very intense supervision. They have a treatment team of the judge, a probation officer, maybe treatment professionals, prosecutor, public defender who are watching, planning, monitoring what they're doing, what progress they're making, and when they step back and fall back. And they move to a point where they're ready to graduate from the program. We have a ceremony to honor them and recognize their achievement. And I've been to these ceremonies, they'll turn to members of their family and they'll say, you know, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for how I hurt you. Um, I know I've I know I've done things that I can't forgive and that are very hard to forgive, but I am now going to I'm now on a path where I'm going to be able to live a clean and sober life. And I, you know, I, I hope you'll be there with me to make sure that I, I stay on that path. I mean, that's what we want. We want people we want to get to the point where folks are able to break out of uh, the addictions or the mental illness that sort of cause them to become into the system and they can find a new, a, a new path ahead. That doesn't mean they're not going to be held accountable. They have to be held accountable for their actions, but you have to look at what achieves the best results. How do we use the resources we have to get us to the place where we keep ourselves the safest? And that's really uh, a conversation that's been going on now probably for about 10 years. Uh, interestingly, it's a conversation where folks from very different political perspectives are able to find some common ground. Uh, this happened nationally, and it's happened. I think it happens here as well. And again, something like the Women's Court Pilot Project, I think, has tremendous potential to hopefully move us forward uh, to a, just a different approach to women's women's corrections here in Hawaii. And I'll just say one thing, Jay. There's a group called the uh, Women's Prison Project, which sort of sprung up organically. Uh, amazing group of women, really accomplished women from a variety of different walks of life. Uh, which engaged at the legislature last session and was instrumental working with the Women's Legislative Caucus to make a lot of these bills uh, move forward. Uh, and they're going to be with us, I think, to stay. And I think, uh, you know, we welcome their participation because, again, how can we envision doing this better in a way that's going to keep people safe, use the resources we have in the best way possible, uh, but hopefully be able to ensure that, you know, women who have kids are going to be able to raise their kids uh, and those without having them go again into the child welfare system or be raised by someone who's not going to care about them or take care of them. And then we have kids who are, again, you know, they're, they, they're, they're going to have significant issues down the road. How can we avoid that um, sort of compounding uh, of the uh, effect of the trauma that these women have undergone? It's certainly the, the enlightened view seems to me. Um, and it's, uh, of course, it has to be judgmental in the sense that this is the judiciary we're talking about, but in a funny way, it's not judgmental. It's, a, it's part of the social safety net. It reaches beyond classical criminal justice. Um, and good for you that, you that you think that way, that you're you know, in, in, into that kind of enlightenment. At the same time, however, you're a CEO. Um, you have to go out and select district court judges. You have to handle and uh, encourage all your various employees and professionals around you. Um, you recently appointed Annalisa Bernard to the District Court of the Second Circuit, and you encouraged Brandon Kimura to apply to the Institute for Court Management in the National Center for State Courts. You know, this this is in itself could be a full time job. And and um, you you know you oversee um, the the fiscal plant, the infrastructure of the judiciary. Uh, recently, um, you know, you you did some work on the upgraded the Maui uh, the Wailuku Courthouse. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, I suppose you taking a part time course at the uh, uh, university in the School of Architecture. Is that right, CJ? Um, so you've got all these things on your plate. 
in addition to hearing cases and writing opinions and, and thinking about public policy. Uh, my goodness gracious, uh, how do you do all that? Well, you know, I got I got great people around me. I mean, the, the one thing I've tried to do is, you know, get really people who care deeply about our community, who uh, are motivated by public service and bring them in here and empower them and, and turn them loose, try to develop a, a broad vision for them to work towards, encourage and support them and, and, and let them achieve what they can, you know, all that they can achieve if, they, if they're empowered. So that's really been what I've tried to do. You know, I have a very unique uh, uh, responsibility under our constitution, Jay, which is I select our district court and family court judges um, the governor selects our circuit court, which are, you know, criminal trial courts and civil trial courts where they're jury trials um, and our, our appellate court judges. But for the district court where folks go for traffic cases, small claims, uh, landlord tenant disputes, family court, where literally everything from divorce to child welfare to juvenile cases. I have the incredible responsibility to pick those judges. That's something I take really seriously. Um, I try to make sure that we have people who are passionate about public service, who know what they're doing, who are experienced, who are, have great temperament, and uh, who see the bigger picture of wanting to uh, make us a better institution and impact the community in a positive way. So, um, and we have a great group of judges. You know, we have, I think one thing that uh, has caught, you know, sort of has, has happened, which I think is amazing, is we're now... We were basically 50-50 women and men among our full-time judges. So I think um, that speaks a lot about the type of institution we are. We're a place where there's opportunity, where we try to reflect our community. We can do, for sure we can do better. And for sure there are communities uh, where we'd like to see more representation from, but we're working on it. You know, we, 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 we made a conscious effort to try to reach out to and show people this is the path. If you want to become a judge, this is how you how you get there. And um, I think it's really reflected in the folks we've had. It's an incredibly strong group of people. They really care, uh, and that's something I you know I think really is just a very very important thing to know about us as an institution. So, and you know Brandon is a great example of someone who um, I think you know uh, again you you get great people. You give them the opportunities to develop themselves professionally. And then you let them do their work and support them, and they'll do great things for you. And Brandon's a great example of that. He's a wonderful leader. And what about the School of Architecture? <laughs> we get, um, you know, we get, a, you know, we get great architects uh, to come in and design buildings that are functional. But we try to, without uh, breaking the bank, try to make them attractive. And uh, you know, I think we've done that. You know, we we built a new courthouse in Kona uh, while I was Chief Justice. It really is a very it's a functional building. I think we are now up to, I think we are lead silver. We might be lead gold. So we're very, uh, we're very energy efficient. And uh, that's something that folks over there have been waiting 30 years for. So, uh, you know, it's again, we try to, we try to identify opportunities to uh, ensure that the physical plant, um, you know, provides a safe uh, and, and functional environment for people to come and have their cases adjudicated. You know, a great example, Jay, is if you're on if you're on uh, Peekoy, uh, there's a very you know where the old Alder Street detention facility used to be. There is now a high rise um, uh, high rise housing uh, that's that's affordable housing in essence, and on that property has been built out a facility for juveniles who are who need a place to stay that's not. Uh, it's 24 seven, but it's not locked up and secure. And that's gonna be on that property. And there's gonna be programming for juveniles in our, who are coming into our justice system where we can have them come in after school. We can uh, monitor them. We can work to try to make sure they're going on a better path. And we did that in consultation with the, uh, the Hawaii Housing Development Authority uh, who basically funded the project um, and the with the legislator's support and Scott Psyche was instrumental in that, but we had the land. So that partnership, uh, really a unique partnership, I think is gonna play out in a way that's very, very beneficial to the community. So when folks drive up P.E. Koi, take a look at that building on the right, that's I think government working the way it should be. And Rod Miley, who's our administrative director was instrumental in working with Speaker Psyche and other folks from HHFDC to make that a reality. Wow, looking back, you know, down, 
um, down the, uh, the course of your administration. You've done so many things. And I've always seen you in a continue increasingly um, to see you as a, as a vuncular, as kind, as a protector of our state, uh, taking us to new places and protecting against, against um, you know, the risks and dangers of modern life. So uh, I want to thank you. I thank you for coming on Think Tech and thank you for all the things you're doing. And I hope we can do this again because I think it's really important that you speak to the people. Well, I really appreciate it, Jay. And like I said, you know, their, their, their voices that you know, I'm not sure they would be heard as effectively or as often in our community if Think Tech wasn't there to provide them with the forum. And I'm very grateful to you and your team for doing that and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you. CJ Mark Rechtenwald of the Hawaii Supreme Court. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.